Hello everyone. Welcome to the first lecture of Compiler Design. The course Compiler Design deals with the study of compilers. And in this particular session, we will first learn about the emergence of compilers, followed by the different phases of it. Also, by the end of this lecture, we will see the course plan, prerequisites, and the target audience for this particular course. So, without any further ado, let's get to learning. Now, we all know computers are electronic machines. Or, in other words, they understand only zeros and ones. Therefore, in early days of computation, instructions to a computer were given using perforated paper tapes and punch cards. In these, the presence of a hole is representation of zero and absence means one. Now, writing down instructions in the form of ones and zeros is pretty hectic. Let me show you how. Let's take this word punched card. If we convert this into its equivalent binary using ASCII standard, now ASCII stands for American Standard Code for Information Interchange, it becomes this. Now, this is the format which computers can process directly. But for us, it is almost impossible. Even if it becomes possible for any human to encode instructions like this, it is undoubtedly time consuming. Now, think about the situation carefully. At one hand, we have a machine that has immense potential. We can employ it to solve many of our problems. But on the other hand, we are facing an awful lot of trouble while communicating with it. So, what is the solution? Since we are facing a communication barrier, we need language translator. In simpler terms, we will say punch cards and the middleman, that is the language translator, will convert that into the strings of ones and zeros. Over the time, computer scientists came up with various language translators. The first one was the assembler. Debuted in the late 1948, these language translators could translate assembly language into its machine code, that is, streams of ones and zeros. Now, assembly language has a very strong correspondence between the instructions of it and the architectural specification of the computer. That means, in order to write instructions for the computer in assembly language, the coder needs to have a proper knowledge about the computer's architecture first. It seems tedious too, doesn't it? So, in the 50s, two new language translators, the interpreter and the compiler came into picture. PHP, Ruby, Python, JavaScript are some examples of interpreted languages. That is, when we write programs in this, the respective interpreters run through the programs one line at a time and finally convert the programs into machine codes. On the other hand, C, C++, Erlang, etc. are some common examples of purely compiled languages. That is, programs written in these are converted directly to the machine codes. Compilers tend to be faster and more efficient than interpreters. So, this is how compilers came into picture. Now, many of us know about the C programming language, right? Although, nowadays it is classified as a middle level language because of various features like direct memory access through pointers, bit manipulation using bitwise operators, and the ability to embed assembly code within C programs. However, Originally, it was classified as high-level language because syntactically, C codes are almost like the English language. Let's consider this piece of C code. Now, it is a very basic program code. This hash include stdio.h is actually a preprocessor directive which specifies the standard input-output header file should be included in this program. Now, coming to the next portion, it is the definition of the main function. In C, the default written type of main is int. Now, here we have four integer variables, x, a, b, and c. 
Now apart from x, a has been initialized with the value 2, b with 3 and c is initialized with 5. Coming to the next statement, it's actually an arithmetic expression. Here, first b is multiplied with c and thereafter the result is added with a and finally it is assigned to the variable x. And here we are printing the calculated value of x on the screen using this printf function. By the way, we have to include the standard input output header file because we are using the printf function. If we don't want to print the value of x on the screen, we need not write this line. Now finally, here we are returning 0 because this function main is not supposed to return anything under error free execution. Now if you observe, this piece of code is close to English, right? Header file is being included using hash include preprocessor directive. The main function is actually the main part of the code. Integers are given the data type named int. And finally printing is happening through the printf function. So it is in human readable form, but the machine cannot understand it. We usually call it the source code or high level language code. And the job of the language translator is to convert this high level language code into executable machine code. Now let me walk you through the internal architecture of the language translator. Specifically for C language, the language translator has four different phases. The first one is the preprocessor. This preprocessor will resolve all the preprocessor directives. As for this particular code, Reading the hash include preprocessor directive, it will append the standard input output header file to the high level language code, removing the preprocessor directive. Also, it will remove all the comments. So now, the high level language becomes a pure high level language. The next one is the compiler. This phase will generate the equivalent assembly language code. As you can see, this is the assembly code of this pure high level language code and the compiler is responsible for this translation. Thereafter, this assembler will generate the relocatable machine code. Now, relocatable machine code is actually streams of ones and zeros, which is actually the machine code. However, this is relocatable. Okay, let me put it to you this way. A program turns into a process during execution, right? And only during execution it is allocated to the main memory. So before execution, we cannot know where exactly in the RAM the process will be allocated. So for that time being, the sequence of the machine code instructions is given a relocatable address. As you can see, here the first instruction has the address i plus 0, and then the successive ones have i plus 1, i plus 2, and so on. Basically, these are sequential. Here, i is the variable which signifies the relocatability. Finally, the last one, that is the linker and loader, these generate the absolute machine code, that is actually the executable machine code. This one is basically the process which has been loaded into the RAM and is ready for execution. See? These are some sequential absolute addresses. So this sees the underlying architecture of the C language translator. Now from all these, the second one, that is the compiler, is what we are going to focus on in this compiler design course. Now coming to compilers, it has six different phases. These are lexical analysis, syntax analysis, then the semantic analysis phase, after that, the intermediate code generation phase, the code optimization phase, and last but not the least, the target code generation phase. Now phase-wise, the first three phases are called analysis phase, whereas the remaining three are known as synthesis phase. However, from a software's perspective, the first four phases, that is the lexical, syntax, and semantic analysis phases, and along with that, the intermediate code generation phase, these four are called the front end. And the remaining two, that is the code optimization, 
and the target code generation phase are called the backend. And why so? Suppose we have an existing C compiler for Windows platform. Now we would like to build a C compiler for a Mac operating system. For this, we can modify the backend, that is, these two phases, according to the Mac specification, and have those newly created backend phases merged with the existing frontend, and it will. We now have the C compiler for the Mac OS. Now, alongside these six phases, there are two more components of the compiler the symbol table manager and the error handler. Information gathered from analysis phase are stored in the symbol table and used by the synthesis phase. And the error handler deals with the error detection and recovery. So these two are used by all the six phases. Now in a nutshell, this is exactly the compiler design course. Now if we talk about the course plan, that is the syllabus, it is as follows. Chapter 1 will be the introduction. Here we will cover the symbol table and the lexical analyzer. Chapter 2 will be the syntax analyzer. In this chapter, we will get to know about different classifications of context-free grammars. Next up is the top-down parsers. Here we will mainly focus on the recursive descent and LL1 parsers. Also, while covering LL1 parsers, we will learn about first and follow. In chapter 4, we will learn about various bottom-up parsers in details. First, we will study the most unique parser, that is the operator precedence parser, and thereafter we will learn about various LR parsers. Next up is the SDTS or Syntax Directed Translation Schemes. This is basically the semantic analysis phase. Here, we will learn how the compiler looks for meaningfulness in our code. Now, Chapter 6 will be all about intermediate code generation phase. Intermediate codes can either have a linear form or a tree form. We will observe the very popular three address codes and the directed acyclic graphs there. Finally, Chapter 7 will be all about runtime environment and code optimization phase. In runtime environment, we will get to know about the process structure in details. And in code optimization phase, we will observe various machine independent and dependent code optimization techniques. So basically, our proposed syllabus will have seven different chapters. Now, since it is not a basic course, in order to study compiler design, the learners need to have a basic understanding of the subject theory of computation. So, I strongly recommend you all to go through our beautifully presented theory of computation course. Now, coming to the audience whom keeping in mind this course has been designed, all the college and university students can take this course because this course will be taught comprehensively. Next, any aspirant willing to take part in any competitive exam will be able to lucidly understand many numerical problems along with the most apt illustration of the theory involved in those. Finally, any computer science admirer who just wants to get wise in this subject, or anyone who wants a quick detailed recall about any topic of compiler design can refer to the lectures. Alright people, that will be all for this session. In the next session, we will observe all the phases of compiler with the help of a proper illustration. So, I hope to see you in the next one. Thank you all for watching.